Let's go to Colossians and uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verses 6 through 10 is what we're looking at today because I think this is probably the core uh, or the beginning of the core section of, of Colossians. And Paul is dealing with uh, uh, a lot of the central message and theology of, uh, of this book. And, uh, and often his letters were written uh, around a theme or a situation or a condition that, that he was addressing. And that's what we find here uh, in Colossians uh, as well. And uh, similar to what had happened in uh, uh, Galatia, where uh, people came and tried to say, well, the gospel, you know, you've, you've got to follow the law. And others in in uh, Corinth had false teachers that came and were distorting the truth. Well, the same thing happened in Colossae. And there seemed to be a particular type of false teaching in this city of Colossae that, that happened. And so Paul is telling Christians here that they need to have uh, biblical truth so that they can grow up in their faith. And I want us to start at verse 6 then of Colossians 2. As Paul says, so then... Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord by grace and by faith in that message of the gospel, he says, continue to live in him, okay? Not in something else, not in something added, but in him. Rooted and built up in him, him alone. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Then Paul gives a warning. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. Now, when he says human tradition and basic principles, uh, the uh, word for basic principles can also refer to the angelic spirits or the fallen angels, uh, uh, the fallen uh, divine beings of sorts. And, uh, uh, and it's kind of the, in answer to the question that Nathan from Kentucky asked in our children's sermon. But he says it depends on human traditions and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. And we're going to stop right there and may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Now, uh, I know that there's, there are disappointments in life, but there's probably none so crushing that scars us so badly as uh, discovering that the chocolate Easter bunnies are really hollow. You know, when I was a kid, I thought these were just pure chocolate. You know, and I saw them, and I thought, man, I really, I really want one of those. And then mom and dad brought one home one day, and I discovered that this stupid thing is hollow. There's nothing of real substance in it. It's 90% air with a little, it's a chocolate coating on air. And, uh, you know, and I have never been the same since, Okay. It was a scarring, damaging event in, uh, in my life. It was an empty illusion. It was a hope that was dashed uh, immediately. And uh, now, you may think that that's a little overly dramatic, okay? But, uh, but it was a discovery that there, there wasn't chocolate from the top of their little bunny ears to the bottom of their little bunny toes, and, uh, you know, and last week we looked at the resurrection hope that is so central to the gospel. And we talked about the evidence of the resurrection. And, uh, and this week as we look to Paul's letter in Colossae, we see that there was another hope that claimed to have equal standing with the gospel. It was brought by false teachers who came to Colossae and they were attempting to hollow out that hope of the resurrection. 
uh, the hope that Christians had of being secure uh, in their faith. And what they were doing, they were emptying out the substance of, of Christian faith. Now, a hope that is real hope blesses our life. But a hope that is hollow, much like the chocolate Easter bunny, has the power only to disappoint us. And when we look back at the first century, we discover that the hope of the resurrection was really a threatening message to the Greek culture. Uh, that Greek culture commonly believed that any material substance was evil by its very nature, and the spirit was essentially good. You know, so matter evil, spirit good, end of debate. Well, then along comes this message of the resurrection, and people say, well, how can that be? That doesn't fit our presupposition here, our whole cultural uh, understanding and philosophy. Now, that happened in Israel. Uh, if you look in uh, uh, Acts chapter 4, um, you see that there was a resistance to the message of the resurrection, particularly by the Sadducees. And we say, now, why were they so resistant to the idea of the resurrection? It was because that they had been influenced by Greek philosophy. And so the Sadducees, in adopting the Greek philosophy, said, well, the resurrection can't happen. And so immediately, as Peter and John were proclaiming the resurrection, the Sadducees were uh, opposing it. Now, when Paul took the gospel to Athens, it says there in Acts 17, uh, he spoke uh, with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and, and again, they said, this guy's crazy. He's talking about something called the resurrection. And so we see this general resistance to this idea of, of the resurrection that we uh, have just celebrated on, on Easter Sunday. The truth of the resurrection pushed back against all of the popular assumptions of the culture of that day. But in Colossae, they were caving in to, those, to that cultural understanding. And by its emphasis uh, on the fact that God in Christ took on flesh and that he was bodily resurrected, the gospel just sounded like so much foolishness to many Greek ears. It's like, this can't be. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 22 to 24, it says the Jews demand signs, and it says, and the Greeks look for wisdom. There's that emphasis on philosophy, that they could generate truth from their own minds. Uh, and he says, but we preach Christ crucified, a resurrection, a, a truth of the crucifixion and the resurrection that is revealed to us in history. But it says a stumbling block to the Jews who said, well, how could he die on a, on a cross? That would be a curse. And foolishness to the Gentiles who said it was impossible for that to happen. In verse 24, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And, and so that, that gospel message spoke directly into not only the Jewish culture, but into the Greek culture. And as Paul writes this letter of Colossians, he's writing it from a Roman prison to Christians who had abandoned the truth and hope of the gospel and its message of the resurrection to adopt a hollow belief reflecting the popular cultural perspectives of that day. So what was going on with these Christians then is they were saying, well, here's Greek philosophy and here's Christian revelation. And so... We've got to make this fit into this. And they wrestled with it and put it all together and said, there, now, now we can, we can rest in that. We can believe that. And, uh, and, and so the gospel and, and biblical doctrine was being badly distorted. Now, with that problem, one of Paul's students, Epaphras, from Colossae, was concerned about the doctrinal issues of this church. Epaphras had probably planted uh, that church as Paul gave training in, uh, 
in Ephesus, and Epaphras probably came out and planted maybe three of these churches around uh, uh, Laodicea and Hierapolis and Colossae. But Epaphras was concerned that this false doctrine not spread through these three churches that were located very close to each other. And so Paul comes to Rome, and we can imagine him sitting uh, in that prison or the house that, uh, where Paul was under house arrest and asking Paul, you know, could you do something about this? This is a church that's, that's in trouble. And so in response to this request, Paul writes this letter. He sends it with Epaphras, and in that letter he warns the believers of, in Colossae of the dangers of mixing Greek philosophical ideas with the gospel message that corrupt biblical doctrine, empty the resurrection of its power and its hope, and the, empties the gospel of its power to save and transform lives. Now, the popular cultural belief then in matter is evil and spirit is good was leading the church into a denial of fundamental doctrines of the faith because <clears throat> as they were trying to fit these two ideas, one based in reason, one based in revelation, they had to distort the revelation that they had received. And uh, they began to call into question the very nature of Christ as God because they said, well, spirit would never take on material form. So they would deny that Jesus came in the flesh and they would question then Jesus' rightful place as creator and king and Lord of all. They said, well, that, that couldn't be. And so they began to attack the nature of Christ. And needless to say, this syncretism this mixing of different doctrines or ideas was tampering with truths at the very core of the Christian gospel and destroying the ultimate hope of believers. It was hollowing out the hope that we possess as Christians. The teaching in Colossae then was this mishmash of ideas all stirred together and then it was poured into the minds of Christians polluting their thought, stealing their clarity, and hindering their growth toward maturity. It's like drinking chocolate shakes and thinking, you know, you're going to get healthy uh, from that, you know, or eating cotton candy and saying, man, I'm going to make a full diet of cotton candy and I'm going to get healthy with this. It's called the cotton candy uh, health diet and... and uh, Paul writes to them and says, you know, you've got to grow up and you've got to, you've got to depend on biblical doctrine to, to do that. Now, this heresy then that was, came about in Colossae was a threat to the substantial hope of the gospel and it depended on Greek philosoph philosophical ideas of unaided human reason rather than revelation from God. And to their way of thinking... If Jesus were God, he would never desire such a thing as a resurrected, restored body because that body took on flesh again. And, and, and their teaching was, if you get rid of this body, be done with it. You never, ever want it again. And Christians were saying, no, God is going to restore this body. He's going to redeem even the body of believers the resultant tragedy of all of this was that their minds were pressed into the mold of their surrounding culture and their certain hope of the gospel was, was hollowed out. Um, it was whittled down to an expectation of a, a mere disembodied existence at death. Their teaching was then that you die, and, and sadly, we sing this song, I'll Fly Away. Well, that was a little bit Gnostic in their understanding. It was like, well, you fly away, and then you're done. That's it, people. Well, that's only step one, okay? The Christian said there's something beyond simply you know, going to heaven when we die. There's the promise of, of the resurrection. And, and so the Gnostics taught that, that at death, 
the soul like a bird would finally be set free from this confining cage of human flesh. And that was it. That was their entire understanding. And so the resurrection couldn't be true. But the Christian hope is so much more than just an I'll fly away theology. And even in our own day, I'm sorry, Harold, I know you like that song, okay? But, uh, uh, but there's a danger that the pure gospel may be watered down and weakened by unexamined cultural ideas. Paul calls believers then to renew their minds and to think as Christians. He doesn't want us to, to muddy our minds with a mixture of, of truth, biblical truth and philosophical ideas that don't make any sense. Now, he's not saying that philosophy is bad, and it's not, but this particular brand of it was destructive. In Romans 12, 2, there uh, Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's what the Colossians were doing. They were really conforming to the culture around them, trying to make the gospel fit to all of the cultural expectations. So then we make the gospel acceptable to the people around us. But Paul said, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means that we've got to step outside of our cultural philosophies and our cultural ideas to truly think as Christians. And uh, he says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, as we understand that we rest in, in the revelation that we have received. Paul warned Christians of the dangers of consuming this mixture of truth and error that would only distort, drain, and destroy their solid and sure hope in Christ. And he encouraged believers to stand firm in the gospel as it had been presented to them, knowing that without this, a mature Christian faith would be impossible. Notice in verses 6 and 7, it says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord with the truth of the revelation uh, of the gospel, continue to live in him, rooted and built up. So as you are saved, so you, by grace, you live by grace in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So he's saying, it, hang on to the truth that you received uh, originally. Now, uh, such philosophies of men then, Paul was saying, can only provide a hollow and deceptive hope, leading us toward wishful thinking at best and to despair at worst, since they're based upon human reason cut loose from the mooring of revelation and adrift in a sea of confusion. And once we leave Biblical truth, we, the boat drifts everywhere and we end up with no sense of what is real truth and we end up lost in that sea of confusion. Now, Paul in, uh, in verse 8 says, see to it that no one takes you captive, that they capture your mind by these ideas, by ideas through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. So Christian truth then is, is reasonable. Paul isn't saying don't be reasonable, just sort of get a feeling and run with it. Paul wants us to be reasonable as Christians but he wants reason to build upon a foundation of revelation. And, and if we destroy the foundation of revelation, we're going to make a lot of mistakes from the, if, if human reason is our only foundation that's, that's left. And, uh, and so Christian truth is reasonable. It builds upon a foundation of revelation, and it constructs a firm hope that stands firm through difficult times. And if we destroy biblical revelation at the foundation and we depend only upon reason, Jesus says the whole house is going to crumble, okay? Notice in Matthew 7 and verses 24 and 25, Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, 
biblical revelation and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He goes on in verse 25, and he says, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Now, as Christians then, that has to be our foundation. And these teachers in Colossae were, were attempting to whittle away and destroy and damage that foundation and say, we can build truth and build our lives on just philosophical speculation. And Paul is telling them, no, you can't. Your house will fall just like Jesus said it would in the other verses there in, in uh, Matthew 7. The scriptures repeatedly remind us that the Christian does not depend upon reason alone as our foundation. In fact, we read in Proverbs 3, 5, that we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Now, to trust in the Lord then is to trust his word. And once we leave that, we begin to become dependent upon our own understanding. That was the mistake Eve made in the garden and it's the mistake that people are still making and it's the mistake that the Colossians were making. They were setting aside biblical revelation for what they considered more acceptable ideas. The man without revelation can only lean upon his own understanding, putting his trust in the ideas of man unaided by biblical revelation. And that was what was happening in Colossae and to our surprise, It's still happening today. We're not very smart, okay? We need revelation and to be anchored in that in order to to have stability in our lives. The Gnostics claim to receive direct messages from God. And today, many are claiming the same thing. Many modern Gnostics, wrapped in the garb of our TV preachers, claim that they regularly receive messages from God with little or no evidence of the reality of their hyper-spiritual claims. I saw one man uh, this week claim that God told him of the coronavirus several months ago, but there's, he can't produce any evidence of that. I guess he forgot to tell the rest of us, though, and uh, he forgot to notify the Center for Disease Control, which could have been a good idea if he had that Revelation months ago. Um, you know, they might have appreciated a heads up on, on all of this. Uh, another man claimed that, that he spoke and put the coronavirus to death. Now, that happened on March 29th. I don't know. It, it, look at the numbers. He didn't do a very good job putting it to death, okay? Okay. And a lot of these modern TV preachers are really preaching sort of a, a, a renewed Gnosticism that is just as false now as it was then. And, and this man said he, he put the coronavirus to, de- to death and, and we say, well, obviously that didn't happen. Now, that was similar to a lot of the foolishness that the Colossian believers were accepting as a supplement of secret knowledge that could be added to biblical doctrine. In fact, that's what Gnosticism means, is, is, is the idea of knowledge. And they said, we have special knowledge that you can add to biblical revelation. And then it's going to be really good, Okay. But this secret knowledge, the Gnostics said, was available only to those of advanced spiritual maturity. Now Jude has a name for those teachers. And he says they're clouds without rain. You know, the the clouds build up and then they blow by and there's no rain to refresh the earth. Peter calls them wells without water. You come up to a well and you're hoping there's some water in there to refresh you and there's really nothing, just an empty hope. They promise much, but they deliver nothing. Now, sadly, we're not far removed from such ideas in our own day. And sadder yet, many Christians are trading the substantial hope of the gospel for the hollow hope of hype and hysteria. 
Now, write that down because that is a great sort of little roll of <laughs> the hollow hope of hype and hysteria. I feel like a TV preacher right now, okay? But uh, anyway, just as Paul called for discernment in his day, so he would call the modern Christian to possess such discernment in our own day. And the 21st century is becoming just as foolish as the first century. Many of our modern heresies look very similar to those of ancient days, and false teachers are still telling us that the gospel is just not enough, and neither is Jesus enough. The theme of Paul's letter, however, is that Jesus really is enough. The Gnostics were teaching that Jesus was merely a created being, a lesser God among many lesser gods. And that idea attempted to, to crowd into the church in a few centuries uh, after Paul's writing of this letter. But this claiming that Jesus was a lesser God among many lesser gods, uh, rather than the God of the universe. And there are groups today, cults, that still teach that. The Gnostics taught that these lesser gods were given authority over different domains throughout the universe, and that Jesus just happened to be one of these lesser gods who was in charge of our part of the universe, because he had more matter in him than spirit. And the further you moved away from earth, the more spiritual substance that those gods possessed. Jesus just happened to have more material substance. And that means he wasn't quite as holy as the other higher gods in this uh, panoply of, uh, of gods. Paul, however, makes it very clear that Jesus was not entrusted with mere partial authority over a particular area of the universe, but that he is the Lord of that universe that he has created. He is the fullness of deity, Paul says, in bodily form. And he has the full authority over all of his creation. And Paul is pushing back against this false teaching. How rude of him to say that something could ever be wrong. We live in a day where everything's right and nothing's wrong. And we've all turned ourselves into fools. But Paul says in, in verses 9 and 10, uh, he says, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity, not part of, the, of deity, but the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So it's like the spiritual God has inhabited human flesh. And so matter is not necessarily evil because Christ is going to redeem even material substance. That means that heaven and earth are both redeemed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matter and spirit are both redeemed in the Christian message. And that's part of the richness of our hope. Paul goes on in verse 10, and he says, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. And it's like Jesus isn't one of these little bitty minor gods. He's the God, and he possesses all of the authority over these puny little tyrant gods that bark and holler and shout. Now, uh, we see the same truth in Matthew 28 and verse 18. Because there, at the very end of Matthew's gospel, what does Jesus say? as he's sending out his disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he's not one of the lesser gods. All authority is his. Christians, therefore, do not answer to the authority of these lesser gods of Gnostic Greek philosophy, but to the authority of Jesus who is Lord over all. And that's what Paul had to impress upon these Colossian believers who were trading the richness of their hope for a very hollow, wishful thinking type of belief. We also see Paul emphasizing this truth at, at several points in this letter. In Colossians 1 and 15, Paul tells us 
that Christ is the firstborn over all creation. Now, that idea of the firstborn over all creation is not that he was a created being, but he was given the full authority of the firstborn son, which was a part of inheritance that uh, practice in, in that day. And, and so Christ was given the full authority of the firstborn over all the little gods of Gnostic thought. So it's a, it's, it's a statement of his authority. In the very next verse, Paul tells us not only does Christ have authority over them, it says he in fact created these little gods, little g gods. In Colossians 1 and verse 16, he says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, He's created all things spiritual and material, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, and that's all these little lesser gods. All things have been created through him and for him. Now, Paul is saying something that just is in the face of these false teachers, and he's addressing it pretty firmly right here. Later, Paul makes it even clearer. He says, not only did, does he have authority over them, not only has he in fact created them, but later Paul tells us that Christ has also defeated them. Notice in, uh, in uh, Colossians 2 and verse 15, it says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, those lesser gods that the Colossians were beginning to worship, it says, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, by the cross. And he paid for the sins of man, he overcame all the forces of darkness, and he is Lord of all. And that's the message of, of Colossians. Now, when he says he defeated them, this would seem to indicate that there was some rebellion of these beings that occurred in the ancient past. And Paul is referring to that. And he's saying these ancient beings that were involved in some sort of rebellion were now put down by Christ's victory at the cross. And when Paul talks about the victory at the cross, I believe he's referring to the package deal of the resurrection as well. Therefore, Paul is telling the Colossian believers to end their, okay, stupid worship of these lesser gods who in reality had no authority over them and no right to rule over them. Sadly, many today still refuse to recognize God as creator, pretending instead to think that we were created by chance. Now, it's interesting how we've moved the pendulum over 2,000 years. Because 2,000 years ago, people were saying, the Greeks were saying, oh, it's all in the spirit. And, and that's where the emphasis needs to be. Now, we've made the opposite mistake today. We've swung the pendulum to the other side, and we say, now everything is material. That's where we'll discover meaning in life. And we discover that both are wrong, because the gospel redeems both matter and spirit. And uh, today, we justify our rejection of the truth of the gospel by the belief that material forces are all that exist within the universe and that there is nothing spiritual at all. That's sort of our modern perspective, not our postmodern, but it's our modern perspective. Because of our modern philosophy of materialism, many place their faith then in money, as long as I can have material goods, that gives meaning to my life. Others say, my meaning is physical exercise. As long as I've got health, I've got everything. No, you don't. If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. But yet people say, oh, let's put our emphasis on physical exercise. I'm going to be healthy. Well, that's good. But it's not the gospel. Others say, well, I, I practice particular dietary practices. And, and by my dietary practices, I can extend my life. But they do that while they ignore the next life. And we're busy cramming our bodies with bean sprouts 
and thinking that we've discovered the meaning of life. That is a form of materialism. And it's a false philosophy. And yet we live by that stupidity in our own day. And at times as Christians, that materialism creeps into our souls and our minds because we fail to examine the truth of the gospel and think deeply about it. But there's still some like the ancient Colossians who accept the rea reality of the spiritual world. But even now, they mix the gospel with Eastern religious ideas that are very similar to the Gnostic ideas of Paul's day. So yes, even today, men are still hollowing out the Christian hope from anything of real substance. But for the Christian, our hope is substantive. It is strong enough to rest in it, to rejoice in it, and to rely on it. We don't need to reconfigure it into something that reflects the culture around us or that the culture finds more acceptable. The Colossian Christians already tried that. It didn't work then, and it won't work now. It will not bless your life. It will only confuse your thinking. The message of Colossians is that Christ is the substance of your hope. Paul describes him in Colossians 1.27 as Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Christ is sufficient. He is enough. And he will always be enough. Don't add to that. Don't subtract from it. And don't tamper with it. Live in it. He is your hope. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you that Jesus is enough. And Lord, just like the Colossians, we try to add this and that to the, the perfect gospel that has been given to us, the perfect hope that has been entrusted to us, the perfect message that, that we have been given to proclaim. And Lord, we think we can add to it and improve it. Lord, Forgive us for our arrogance. Forgive us that we have hollowed out hope to make it something that it was never meant to be. We've turned it into wishful thinking instead of the firm and solid hope that you desired to, for us to possess as believers in Jesus Christ. Lord, renew that substantive hope within us. Take away the hollowness, Lord, of wishful thinking and Lord, when we buy our next Easter bunny, make sure it's full. Make sure it's filled head to toe with chocolate. And Lord, when we come to you, I pray, Lord, that our faith would be filled with the substance of hope that only comes from Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.